Vinyl peeps, we've got a new feature for you. What's spinning round and round on our turntables? We just thought it'd be nice to uh, let you guys know. We, we talk about records and we do shows and talk about those records, but those aren't necessarily the ones that we're listening to right now. So we thought it might be nice to share with you a little of what we're listening to here in the last few weeks and, you know, yeah. See, see what you guys think of that. So I think John's going to start us off here with... Yeah, and these are fun things that may not fall into any of our themes. Yeah, absolutely. So first on the hit parade, Mojo Nixon and Skid Roper. And Mojo, we just lost Mojo. What a bummer, man. Yeah. I, his radio show, I, I listened to it as often as I could. It was, he was just... A character. Yeah, and the show was called Loon in the Afternoon. Oh, he had a he had a couple of them. Yeah, I think the one he was known for was Loon in the Afternoon. <laughs> which, he he was a, a loony guy. Yeah, yeah. His uh, his music can best be described as psycho psycho Billy. Billy. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of punk alternative rockabilly. Mm-hmm. And. That's a great mixture. That that includes a lot of stuff yeah. that I love. I just really don't have any of his stuff on vinyl. He's somebody I discovered when I worked at a record store in college. And I just, maybe I heard a song on MTV mm-hmm. and I'm just like, I was sucked in all the way. Yeah, yeah. And he definitely uh, was not a share, afraid of sharing his opinions either. No, <laughs> no, not at all. And I mean, the songs are... Totally off the wall. This one is the one that has the infamous Stuffin' Martha's Muffin, <laughs> which is, even though he was getting airtime in, on MTV with Elvis is Everywhere, mm-hmm. he made this song about uh, Stuffin' Martha's Muffin, which uh, was before Elvis is Everywhere. He figured out, oh, I, I better do something a little more uh, mainstream. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the the album starts out with the amazing Bigfoot diet. Yeah. I hate banks, which is awesome. I hate <laughs> banks too. <laughs> Feeling essential. Existential. Ex- existential. See, I couldn't read. Yeah. Be my lover. I'm it's not a question. Oh, it's not an offer. <laughs> Where the hell's my money? Yeah. Well, I'm, going back to the I hate banks. Yeah, I'm thing. constantly wondering where in the hell my money is. Yeah, he, he's great, man. I I I really need to dig into yeah. some of his stuff. I I just like it's it's almost like a comedy album, right? It's just a total. It's a, kind of a modern day. Well, it's not even modern day, but it's a later incarnation of uh, Ray Stevens. Yeah, I'd say Ray Stevens and Frank Zappa. Yeah, mixed together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good combo. But how old was he? Do you remember when he died? Uh, let's see. I th- he had to be close to seventy. Well, right. 57 to February 7th, 2024. Okay, so that's... You do the math. Nobody 67, be, yeah, I think. 67. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Or he might have been 77. Shit. No. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, it's a shame that he passed away. But man, what a mark... What a mark he made. Yeah. I mean, it, and just because his stuff wasn't necessarily like serious, I think there was there were some serious underpinnings there. Yeah. But it certainly wasn't on the like novelty. No, level. it wasn't total off the wall. It's it's music that he wanted played on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, stuff in Martha's Muffin got pretty good airplay. <laughs> I remember it being played on X one hundred three. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, man. Well, yeah. R.I.P. Mojo. Yeah, it was a uh, he was a fun dude, and his uh, it's funny his uh, his career had a lot of ups and downs. But when uh, the big thing that kind of shifted him into another gear and why he started, he had done some acting, mm. and I think the thing that led him to radio, his uh, uh, Enigma Records which was a big alternative label, went bankrupt. Mm. So his catalog was kind of in limbo for a bit. Oh, that's wild. 
Well, there's a crash course in the record industry when something like that happens. And that's happened to a bunch of bands and, and oh, tours. definitely. I mean, it's legendary where you know record labels have just gone kaput and yeah. suddenly bands are left in the lurch. Yeah. Well, that's a good one to start out with. I'm going to go in a different direction. I got this a while back around the time when Jimmy passed away. And this is uh, Songs You Don't Know by Heart. His original Greatest Hits was called Songs You Know by Heart. These are songs from his catalog that he redoes just acoustically. And uh, I, as soon as I heard about him passing away, I was like, man, I, I don't have, uh, I don't think I have any Jimmy Buffett records, and I don't. You don't see them a lot. No, they don't pop up much. Yeah, and I think it's just that, you know, people bought them and maybe a lot of them haven't been uh, repopped and people have just kept them. I mean, yeah. I occasionally I'll see the songs, you know, by heart at a show yeah. or something. But this is great, man, and I love the picture. <clears throat> Excuse me. I love the picture of them on the back. Uh, this, the best, the song on here that I really bought this for is a song called uh, Love in the Library, and I think it's off of uh, Barometer Soup. I've always loved that song, and uh, the fact that he turned it around and did it again made me want to get the record. But you've got I Found a Home, Woman Going Crazy on Gasol, on I'm sorry, Woman Going Crazy on Caroline Street, uh, Love in the Library is on there, 12-Volt Man, uh, Little Miss Magic. Oh, it's a double. Yeah, yeah, it's two records. So I think originally this was like a video series that he was doing of acoustic versions of his songs that his daughter actually directed. Oh, really? Her name's Delaney. And uh, then it turned into an idea to release an album of it. So I'm yeah. intrigued by this. Yeah, you I should. I mean, I've never been a big Buffett fan, but hearing his songs acoustically. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great songwriter. Oh, he's a great songwriter, and I I love his voice. I mean, it, it always reminds me of of having lived in Florida and being in Florida, yeah. and it, it's it it definitely takes me back. So it's a good it's a good album. You should check it out. You know, I he may not be your thing, but I think you might enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, I would. I I think something like this, the acoustic would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Give it a listen, man. What else you got That's playing? Cool what what else you got spinning? Next up on the hit parade, <clears throat> and this is not a hit parade, <laughs> the books. Nice. And, uh, boy, how do I describe these guys? They're an uh, American-Dutch duo formed in New York in 99, consisting of a guitarist and vocalist and a cellist. Interesting. And uh, they're... Uh, <laughs> uh, or guitarist and vocalist and a cellist. Uh, their music incorporated samples from obscure uh, sounds and speech. They released three critically acclaimed uh, albums on a German label and released their fourth album, The Way Out, on a U.S. label. What's, and, you got to say the name of the record. Though. Oh, this is... What is this? I think it's The Lemon of Pink. Yeah, The, the Lemon of Pink. <laughs> <laughs> it's and this i mean i love the die cut yeah and so you, it's a you've like, got a place setting with yeah. a fork and a plate and a knife yeah yeah that's cool and they're they are definitely off the wall i mean the only thing it's it's kind of like a burn and Eno, my life in the bush of ghost mm -hmm. where they take all these i i really like this band yeah and well I, the the sampling yeah. You know, when when that became a thing, it it was done a lot, but not in mainstream music. No. For sure. And this is another band that I, I discovered the way out on that NPR show. Oh, really? Okay. Where they did first listen. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is this is incredible. That's awesome. I love samples and just it's it, I don't know. It's a different kind of music. It's yeah. not really like music like you think. Yeah. It's like an amalgamation of all these different sounds. Well, I mean, uh, anything like that, I think, <clears throat> I think a lot of times the instinct uh, when you hear something that doesn't quite, it's not something you've heard before, it's really hard to take that in and welcome it in 
but I really think it's good for your mind yeah. and and for your heart in listening to music to to have that kind of thing. That's kind of the way jazz is with me in any kind of jazz. It's just it's not predictable. It's not you know mainstream necessarily, and and it kind of explodes your brain to being open to a lot of other stuff that's kind of off the wall. So yeah, and I was I found this at uh, the Karma near me. Super cheap, and I'm like, wow, that's I gotta awesome. have that. That's cool, man. Yeah, you hear about them on NPR and you check them out, and then yeah, you find one of their records. It's one of those things, their stuff's not easy to find. And I'm probably like a lot of other record pickers, I grab the lowest hanging fruit. Yeah, you know, if you walk in a store, you pick stuff that you see or a show, or if you see stuff wind up on your feed, you're like, oh, I'll buy that. Yeah, I don't have that. But this was, so it's not something, I mean, I'm not often looking in depth for stuff I don't have. Yeah. Yeah, is, me neither. Because it's probably a problem. <laughs> well, there's not a lot of stuff that I am searching for. I yeah. mean, uh, there are white whale types of records, but man, I've, I've got a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, and it's hard to, it's hard to dig in and listen to all that stuff. Yeah. So, so I mean... In a sense, anymore, I mean, I've got most of the rock stuff. There's some holes here mm-hmm. and there, but I've got most of the stuff I really want or yeah. need. So I'm looking for unusual and obscure stuff. Yeah. Stuff in between the yeah. in between those lines. That's a good one, man. It's, it's one of those, th- this is one of those bands, you wouldn't put it on at a dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that I like. Yeah. That I don't know that many other people would like. But yeah, that's, that's cool. Fine. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm going to switch gears completely. Oh. <clears throat> this is uh, Iron Maiden's "Number of the Beast" with Beast over Hammersmith, which is a live show uh, packaged with it. And this is the 40th anniversary of "Number of the Beast." I think it came out in 21. Yeah, and I've or I'm sorry, it came out in 22. And this is a legendary Maiden record, and they, they've got so many albums. And as as you get later in their career, their records are doubles or triples. So that's that's a pretty... They've got a lot of music. They've become kind of more of a progressive like metal band, which is really interesting. But anyway, this is a classic, and Beast Over Hammersmith is the live album that comes with it. And uh, it's just, it's great. I mean, it's it's definitely music that it I don't know they're they're so weird because they you know they they don't have a radio hit per se oh no yeah. and you know it's not like they've sold hundreds of millions of of records but they they've become more and more popular as time has gone on and I think I think part of it is if you haven't seen them live you may not be a maiden fan but once you see them live you will be anyway um <clears throat> Number of the Beast, uh, there's one song on here that they switched out. The original version of Number of the Beast had a song called Gangland. And I guess to hear them explain it, they kind of needed to put the album out and they put that song on it, but they didn't really want to. Well, now in this 40th uh, edition, They've replaced Gangland with Total Eclipse, which is the song that they wanted to put on there. And Originally, yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of people would always talk about Gangland as being kind of like an outlier. It doesn't really fit on the really album, fit. but they replaced it on this 40th anniversary version too. And of course, you have the Eddie artwork that'll give you nightmares. That's kind of cool. I, I mean, not a lot of bands. Well, I guess sometimes bands are able to do that with re-releases, yeah. remixes, but you don't see them replacing a lot of songs. Yeah. And I, th- I think it was that they needed to, like, get it out in a hurry, oh. and they and they put it out, and they always wanted to have replaced it with that. So they finally did. So Did that song wind up on any other albums? Nope. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, it may have ended up as a B-side. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, man. Maiden, Number of the Beast, and Beast Over Hammersmith. Been listening to the Maiden records that I have, and I love them. That's What's, cool. What else have you been listening to? What else? Wow. Got another one? I got another one. Sweet. Sinead O'Connor. 
And this was another, I can't remember. It showed up on some deal that mm -hmm. I got a really good buy on the record. And it's one of those, I wasn't actively seeking mm -hmm. because I had it on CD. Ah, and yeah. that's, that's what happens with, with a lot of this stuff you have on CD. It's like, I wouldn't mind having it on vinyl, right? but I'm not just going to go out and get it. It's not a necessity. Yeah. Right. No, that's great. I mean, it, she's obviously since she passed away, <clears throat> I figure I'll clear my throat since somebody's running their engine out there. Uh, since she passed away, she's, I mean, I've heard a lot of talk about her. I've seen a lot of her stuff pop up on some of the vinyl groups that I'm on. And, and, you know, that's great. Um, it shouldn't take somebody dying for people to appreciate an artist, but yeah. sometimes it seems that's the way the, the cards fall. So, yeah, I do not, I do not want what I haven't got. And there's the songs and the cover. Well, not a cover. Prince wrote the song for her. Right. Yeah. And then did his own version. Yeah. And nothing you've compares got, to you. Uh, Chris Cornell's done a cool yeah. version. That's great, man. Yeah. I don't have any of her stuff, so I should. Uh, this is this is the one in my mind. This is the one to get. Yeah. It's a re when it came out, it was just everywhere. Cool. Well, I'll have to do that. And then the other one. The big one with her is the the lion and the cobra. Yeah, is that, I like yeah. I kind of like this album a little bit better. Do you? Yeah. Cool. Well, it's always nice to talk about some of the stuff that you know doesn't make it into a regular show. It's it's we we don't ever do this. We don't ever no. like just say, hey, what are you listening to lately? I mean, if if we are doing a show, we will talk about you know some of the other stuff. But I think we're going to try to intentionally talk about the things that we're personally listening to from now on. And, and we'd love to hear from you on our socials also about what you guys are listening to. We'd love you guys to jump on our YouTube channel and tell us what you'd like to see, what you'd like to see us unbox. Uh, themes for shows. We have a pretty long list of more shows to do with themes, but we need to hear from you guys too. So check us out on the YouTube channel. Listen to the podcast anywhere you get podcasts. And remember, Keep spinning those records, folks. Round and round. What he said.